Welcome back to the world of Eichert, where we learn how to think like the College Board. This lesson focuses on 5.7, Economic Developments and Innovations in the Industrial Age. Let's get right into 5.7 with this bit. Western European countries began abandoning mercantilism and adopting free trade policies, partly in response to the growing acceptance of Adam Smith's theories of laissez-faire capitalism and free markets. Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, challenged mercantilist economic theories and presented arguments for a new economic theory, which we now call capitalism. We went over mercantilism in topic 4.5. Let's compare these two economic theories. In mercantilist theory, the amount of wealth in the world is fixed, and the goal is for states to accumulate as much of that wealth as possible. A favorable balance of trade, which was measured by the amount of gold and silver bullion. Governments were heavily involved in this process, seeking monopoly control of trade goods and regulating the commercial activities of their subjects and citizens. In capitalism, however, the amount of wealth in the world is not fixed. Well wealth could be created. Adam Smith had observed the early days of industrialization in Britain and seen how the division of labor and the use of machines meant that workers could be much more productive in creating products that could be sold. The true wealth of a nation was not just its bullion, but also its productive capacity. Capitalism also advocated much less involvement from the government. Capitalists believed that monopolies stifle innovation. Instead, government should allow free trade and promote competition. If individuals and businesses competed with each other, with everyone pursuing self-interest, the best products and businesses would thrive, which would maximize the wealth of nations. Smith was an Enlightenment thinker, and he believed that people were essentially rational, and if allowed economic freedom, they would make choices based on reason. As Smith described, they would be guided by the invisible hand. This new system called free market capitalism, or laissez-faire capitalism, became increasingly popular in countries in Western Europe, especially Britain. Now look at this. The global nature of trade and production contributed to the proliferation of large-scale transactions transnational businesses that relied on new practices in banking and finance. In topics 4.4 and 4.5, we saw the development of the first global trade networks, and in 5.5, we saw how transportation innovations like railroads and steamships made trade faster. These factors combined with government's embrace of laissez-faire capitalism led to an explosive growth of big business on a global scale. One new type of business was the transnational business, which just means a business that operates across multiple nations. One example is the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank Banking Corporation. It was founded in 1865, shortly after the British gained control of Hong Kong. We'll talk about that more in 6.5, economic imperialism. HSBC was a transnational bank set up to facilitate the growing trade with China. It opened a branch in Yokohama, Japan in the following year. Eventually, it would have branches all over the world. It currently has over $10 trillion in assets under custody. Johnson & Johnson, Bayer, and Coca-Cola are all good examples of multinational corporations that began in the 19th century and still still exist today. We now live in a world dominated by multinational corporations. As these companies grew more complex and sophisticated, they relied on new practices in banking and finance. Two of the examples the College Board provides are limited liability companies and stock markets. Mr. Eichard, didn't joint stock companies from Unit 4 also use limited liability? And wasn't the Amsterdam Stock Exchange founded in 1602? So now they're giving us stuff before the time period. Yes, it is a bit confusing. Limited liability is the idea that shareholders, individuals who own pieces of a company, are only financially responsible for their own investment. They are not responsible for the total debts of the company. Many of the joint stock companies we saw in Unit 4, like the East India companies, were allowed limited liability. But this was a special privilege not available to most people. It was part of these companies' exclusive charter, along with the right to set up monopolies on certain products. It was still very mercantilist. But as laissez-faire capitalist ideas spread, governments allowed more companies limited liability status. For example, in 1855, British Parliament passed the Limited Liability Act, which granted this status to any company with more than 25 members. New York State in the U.S. had done this earlier in 1811, which caused companies to flock there to set up headquarters. Think about the huge impact of this change. In previous eras, without limited liability, individuals who invested in companies could face bankruptcy, debtor's prison, or even worse. If a company they invested in couldn't pay its debts. Not surprisingly, most people were not willing to take this risk, but with limited liability, they became more confident to invest in corporations. This unlocked vast pools of money that businesses could use to expand further. Now, stock markets. It is true that stock markets did exist before this, notably in Amsterdam, but shares were often sold in informal settings like coffee houses. But by the 19th century, they became more official and more sophisticated, and because of new limited liability laws, the scale of business being conducted rose 
grows exponentially. Furthermore, the invention of the telegraph meant that news about the price of stock markets became more instantly available, which led to an increase in the speed and volume of trading shares. Industries of the second industrial revolution we mentioned in topic 5.5 relied heavily on stock markets, especially railroads. By the end of the 19th century, stock exchanges existed throughout Europe, the United States, Japan, India, and China. The last piece of 5.7 is about the effects of industrial capitalism on consumers. Consumer goods are goods that you buy, as opposed to stuff you make yourself, which people used to do a lot more of before industrialization. Electrical appliances, clothing, furniture, and many more things became increasingly available to a wider amount of people, made cheaper by mass production. It also meant that people didn't have to spend the hours of their day making the items they needed to use. So for many people, this meant that they had both more time and more extra money to do things like leisure and entertainment. All these things combined led to an increase in the standard of living for some. For many others in the industrial world, life was not so great. It all depended on one's social class. We'll discuss different social classes and responses to capitalism in our next video. That's all for today. Thanks for joining us on the world of Eichert. We'll see you in the next lesson.